morning, church. Good morning. My name is uh, J.T. Sullivan. Uh, my wife, Lydia, and I lead the youth and family ministry here in Austin. Yes, guys. <laughs> 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 We've been here about a year, a little over a year now. We moved from uh, Kansas. We were about a year, a little over a year ago, in April. Um, so we lead the youth family here. We were um, working full-time there. Um, we were also leading the youth and family ministry there just volunteer. Volunteers. Um, I'm a paramedic by trade, and uh, my wife got a degree in dance from the University of Kansas there. Rock Chalk. Uh, we don't care what all sports are. Boo. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, no, I'm grateful to be here with you. Lynn can't be here. She, uh, one of the teams getting baptized this morning, uh, Ariel Lindsay. So that's the group where she's up there. Uh, and I am down here, so uh, you're welcome. You got to be better looking. <laughs> but uh, no, this morning, guys, um, we're going to be going over uh, why bad things happen to good people. And uh, super controversial at times, uh, challenging for sure. Um, these scriptures, I don't feel like I have it all. I don't know. I don't know it all. But uh, we can't glean some things from scripture. Again, there's not a scripture that's like, okay, when something terrible happens, this is how you're supposed to feel, this is what you're supposed to do, and this is why it happens. Uh, unfortunately, that'll make our, our, our lives a lot easier, but that's not how God works sometimes. We're just going to go over some scriptures today, kind of talk about you know why bad things happen to good people. Um, I'm, a, I'm a creature of habit. Uh, I like things the same way. That's how I feel. Um, my wife and I are living in a uh, apartment complex, and uh, I never parked out front. So I had my truck. I had this little spot off the side. I picked out it's my spot. Right? The tree in the back, I would line it up, primo. It was great, but it, it, didn't, it didn't affect anybody else's parking spot, nothing like that. Um, and so every time, everybody knew that was JT's spot, that was my spot. There was an unwritten rule that that was mine, right? So I come pulling in one day, some young who's in my parking spot, right? And, uh, right. I, <laughs> I'm frustrated, I'm angry, I'm like, God, why did you let this happen? <laughs> this terrible thing happened, and I'm a good person, I don't understand. You know, I went upstairs, and I'm like, Lynn, did you see this guy down here? He's in my spot, I had to park in another spot, this is garbage. Just so we're clear, that's not the bad things we're talking about. We're talking about why the bad things happen. Uh, so that's right. Sometimes it hurts, sometimes it feels like that, but that's not the bad things. Um, I was uh, just kind of scrolling through uh, just some news headlines here in the last couple weeks, um, talking about bad things. And these are just some of the news headlines. Officer shot ambush, had no chance of survival. Nine Americans dead after staying in the from public. Uh, seven dead in New Hampshire car or car crash involving uh, U.S. Marine Fighter Club. Two toddlers found dead in the New York City home. This is real stuff. These are things that you and I look at and we're like, man, I don't understand, God. Why, why are these things happening? I don't understand how you could allow something so terrible to happen to somebody who didn't deserve it, right? Um, and something that even hits a little closer to home. You know, I think we're all feeling a little emotional, a little raw with the Thurston family. We can look at that and we're like, man, I don't understand, God, why this is happening. I don't understand how you would allow something like this to happen uh, to such a young man, you know. And, and we, we got with the team last time. It was, it was heartbreaking. You know, these guys are, they're hurting. You know, a lot of these guys grew up with that thirsty kids and they don't know how to feel. They don't know what to, to believe. They don't know what to, you know, they don't know how to put this in perspective. You know, and, and that's hard. And I think when it comes to stuff like this, our best avenue is to take to God. Our best avenue is to, to take uh, our best avenue is to take it to God's way to put it on, right? Um, Sunny outside, nice day. 
about noon, my partner and I are taking a nap. That's what we do in EMS, earn money sleeping. Um, but uh, anyways, we're, we're sitting there taking a nap, and we get a call over the radio, you know, three, Unit 310 respond emergent to structure fire at such and such address. We're like, awesome, that's great. Structure fires means no, no paperwork for me, and I get to watch the firefighters do some cool stuff, you know? So we're, we're scooting that way. And uh, then dispatch gets on and says, you know, unit 310, 318, 325, 317, 319, respond emergency to such and such address for, uh, for house fire, structure fire. We're like, oh man, something's going on. And so we switch over to the town gets on, he's like, okay, um, he advised we, we pulled one, one victim out of the house, one adult victim. The advisor will pull two adult victims out. And then he starts getting on there. The advisor, we have one pediatric pulled out of his house. Um, the advisor, the advisor, we have a third. So at this time, there's three children and two adults that have been pulled out of this house fire. Um, I was that biggest second unit on scene. And we, we come pulling in. On fire, house is still burning, fire still doing their thing. Uh, and we pull up, and there's just like, bodies just all in the front yard. We jump out, everything goes to slow mo. We're, we're getting out, and the, the dog is dead right by the yard, or right by the tree. Keep going. Mom's there, she's dead. Training just kicks in, she can't help her. Keep going. Fire guy comes running at me, a four year old boy. He's burned up real bad, about 60% burns. Uh, and you just hand off, right? Hand off, put him on the stretcher. And you know, and I, at this point, I, I'm brand new, I've not seen a whole lot. I'm, freaking out, you know? Um, like, oh man, we've got to take care of this boy. So we get him in the back of the truck, we drop a fire medic. So let's get going. And uh, so his airway shot. So I'm like, okay, I'm in the airway, I need to get an IV access. He's so burnt up, the skin is sloughing off of him, right? Uh, our patches won't stick, the EP cuffs just tearing things up. I'm like, I need to get an IV. Can't find an IV, so we, we go ahead and IO, which is a drill, it's a bone drill, stick into, stick into the leg to get IV access. Uh, and I'm, I'm taking care of the airway. As soon as fire medic drills his boy, uh, kid wakes up and starts screaming. Just the screams were just terrible. They're awful, right? Um, and I, I'm like, well, I don't, I don't know what to do here. I'm, I'm just terrible, right? And so the kid actually ends up standing up on the stretcher. And he's just in pain, he's in agony. And he takes his hand and he does a little number like this, and the skin on his face comes off, right? Why do I tell you that story? It's terrible, it's awful. I hope none of you ever have to experience something like that. Um, but this this was a real turning point in my life. I really, after that call, it messed me up for a long time. I mean, it was, it was hard to go to work. It was hard to, to look at. I, I went to a workout a month ago, and there were one of the moms and brother, her boy with it looked just like a kid, you know? And I'm like, still, and this has been four years ago, you know? Um, and that was a time in my life where I really questioned, you know, why did this happen? Why did this little boy, why did this have to happen to him? He was innocent. He didn't deserve this, you know? And I had to really wrestle with God. I really, there's still times, you know, why? I don't understand why that boy had to go through so much for, for what purpose? What was, the, what was the end? What was the reasoning for it? And so I think when we, we talk about this stuff, we need to go to the beginning. You want to go to Genesis 1. Genesis 1, um, starting in verse 28, it says, God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds in the sky and all the creatures that move along the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. We've all heard this story. We've all read it. Um, but this is God's original plan. God's original plan was, hey, we're going to stay in the garden. We're going to live it up. Here's all the food, all the plants, all the animals. This is yours. Go subdue it. Says so he looked back and he saw that it was good, you know. And if we, if you guys know the story, as you continue to read further down, it doesn't take very long for mankind to kind of mess it up. About a chapter and a half, you know. Um, 
Right? Yes, but it's Genesis 3. You know, mankind rejected God and his very good creation. Mankind disobeyed God's simple rule and chose to take the fruit of evil. And as a result, suffering entered the world. Again, in Genesis 3. Romans 5.12 says, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, the death through sin, and in, his, and in this way, death came to all people because all sin. Again, God's intention was the garden. God's intention was to live with us in the garden, you know, to live there harmoniously. But again, he gave us free will, right? God gave us free will, and it took us about a chapter and a half to really blow it, uh, what God's intended purpose was. As we learn and grow in our knowledge of God and who he really is, we learn a few things about his character. We learn that God is merciful. Daniel 9 9. The Lord our God is merciful and forgiving, even though we have rebelled against him. We also learn that God is just. Isaiah 30 18. Yet the Lord longs to be gracious to you, therefore he will rise up to show you compassion. For the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are all who wait for him. And then we also see that God is completely holy. 1 Samuel 2 2. There is no one holy like the Lord. There is no one beside you. There is no rock like our God. You know, these aspects of his nature, particularly his justice and holiness, mean that anything even remotely sinful cannot dwell in God's presence. And it's a hard thing to hear, but biblically speaking, most people, nobody, is good by the standards of God's, by God's definition. In fact, compared to God's standards of holiness, no one is good. Uh, to one degree or another, we all fall short of the glory of God. Uh, this doesn't necessarily mean that we are actively engaging or doing evil or participating in prayed acts all the time. But it does mean that by our very nature, we are fallen. Right. Um, we rebel against God on, on the regular, you know, and all it takes is one time to separate us from God. You know, it's, it's hard. It's hard when we look at these things and we're like, well, that guy was a good, a good person, right? That's how we look at this. We're like, oh, it's good people. But every, all those good people, though they may be nice and generous and compassionate, everybody has their sin. Everybody falls short, and everybody needs a Savior. All of us in this room need a Savior. We can't save ourselves That's on our own. <clears throat> so when we ask the question, why do bad things happen to good people, I think we oftentimes forget that God allowed free will to be brought in to the world. You know, he gave us free will, and because of that free will, we decided to disrespect, to divide, and to be sinful. And that, in turn, separates us from God. You know, this isn't what God wanted, but he allowed it to happen at times. And because of that sin, because of that free will, we separate ourselves from God. Sometimes we feel entitled that we are owed a certain answer when we're talking to God. I know for me, like, God, I don't understand why this happened. You're ridiculous. This is not how I would have done it. So, therefore, that's how you should have done it. And then we go in this weird cycle of, like, we know better than God. Mm -hmm. When, when, when terrible things happen, we see these awful things happen throughout the world, and we don't put it in perspective. You know, sometimes bad things happen for us to realize that our sin is separated from Him. Sometimes, you know, and not all the time, but sometimes the bad things that happen to us or that, that happen around us are so that we can realize that our sin is separated us from Him. We generally view God in one of two ways. Um, I know for me, I, I get to do this a lot. You know, number one is it's God's job to keep human beings happy. Comfortable and pain free. That's what a lot of people assume generally. You know, when they see Christianity, they're like, oh, well, you know, because I love Jesus, he's going to give me all that money. I'm never going to be sick. I'm never going to go through anything because I love Jesus. I don't read that anywhere in scripture. For some reason, we have this, this flawed logic or this flawed idea that that's, that's how God is supposed to show us his love. And I mean, parents in here, you know, if you were just completely always kind and happy and you gave your kids everything, probably be a little disrespectful at times. Sometimes we need to correct, right? When I say we, I do not have children. Maybe that. But, <laughs> yeah. but what I'm saying is, is it's important that we don't look at God as just this guy that gives us everything that makes his life pain free and easy going, right? The second way that we can look at God is God has a purpose for everybody and for human, brain, or, and for human beings and he allows things to happen so that he can bring his people to know and to love him. When we put it in that perspective, it's a little easier to, to make me understand, okay, well, this happened because out of this tragedy, I became closer and I drew closer to God. You know, sometimes it takes terrible things to happen for us to really see our need for God. You know, the reality is, is that comfort tends to make us forget about God a lot of times. 
when we're chilling, when we're having a good time, it's easy to you know, put God on the back burner. Um, it's pretty evident in the world we live in, just because we do. We live in a very blessed nation, very blessed country. And we just see the decline. We see God taking a, a backseat more and more throughout society, throughout um, just our culture as a whole. You know? But yet we see Christianity thrive oftentimes in places where they experience the most fires and persecution and hardship. Now, there are Christians around the world today that go to church and they make, and they, they realize that, you know what, because I call myself a Christian, I'm going to die. I don't know about you, I've never, I've never gotten up and been like, hmm, you know, because I'm a Christian today, I wonder if I'm going to be stoned, I wonder if I'm going to be shot, I wonder if I'm going to be attacked. It's never crossed my mind. But there are people who wake up every day and say, you know what, because I love God, this may be a thing, this may be a cost to my convictions and my, my love for God. <clears throat> for some, suffering leads to an abandonment of belief in God, but for many, the opposite is true. <clears throat> it causes them to see God in a world that seems absurd without him. Many people have counted their pain and suffering as a crucial part of their journey towards Christianity. I know I have. Um, you know, without a lot of the things I've had to go through or a lot of things that I feel like I've had to see or experience, I don't know that I would have seen my need for God, honestly. You know, I grew up in a great home, I grew up, you know, I had good jobs, you know, things like that, but I don't know if I'd actually seen my need for God without those terrible things that I had to, to, to experience or witness, right? You know, perhaps God allows these things to happen so that his glory can be shown through in all these situations. I did not write this chapter. I think it's in John 9, sorry. John 9, uh, as he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus. But this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. After saying this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool. So the man went and washed and came home to see him. You know, this is, this is interesting because, you know, back then, back in the days, hey, if somebody was born blind, well, then somebody must have sinned along the way, right? Somebody must have messed up, and that's why such and such happened. It, it's a lot easier for us to understand, hey, what happened? Somebody messed up, and that's why, you know, my son was born blind. That's why my son can't walk. That's why my son is deaf, things like that. But here Jesus is saying, you know what? No, nobody sinned, nobody messed up. But really what happened here is this man was born blind so that my, so that God's power might be shown, might be displayed through this, right? And that's hard to swallow because sometimes there's just not an answer. Sometimes all it is is that, you know what? God is gonna work through this situation regardless of who you think is at fault or whatever. C.S. Lewis wrote uh, in The Problem of Pain, God whispers to us in our pleasures speaks in our conscience, but shouts in our pain. It is a megaphone to rouse a deaf world. It can be argued that meaningful moral and spiritual growth as human beings requires a world where some suffering exists. You know, we can't learn to be generous unless there's someone who has less than we do, right? We cannot show compassion unless there's someone who needs caring for. If everybody was on the same playing field, how would we do that? What would that look like? These experiences draw us toward being the people he wants us to be. God takes no pleasure in the suffering of his children. 2 Peter 3, 9 says, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. <clears throat> a story here. My, <clears throat> when, I was, uh, when I was six years old, I, uh, my mom taking us out to uh, a restaurant, me and my brother, my brother about four, I guess, at that time. And uh, she was with their, we were at this restaurant we used to go to with uh, another another sister. And you know, they were talking, you know, when you're six years old, it's a big, it's a big deal um, to go up to the buffet by yourself, right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm a big boy, right? And that's, uh, Still don't touch me, mom, I'm ready. You know, I can be in the place, right? And uh, so we're sitting there, to go on, you know, she's sitting in the restaurant and going out to the rest or the, the buffet there and there's a guy that's working there 
and uh, he's an older gentleman, and uh, started talking to me, and then he uh, essentially sexually assaulted me. Was six years old, you know, and then I went back to my uh, my mom, you know, she could tell something was wrong, and finally I ended up telling her what happened, you know, and then, you know, my mom got real defensive, obviously, she's like, all right, I gotta get my kids out of here, and took us out of the car, and, um, and I called the cops the whole night, my mom was, you know, distraught, rightfully so, you know, she was there, and I was, I was maybe like 50 feet from her, and something, something had happened to me, you know, and that's hard, you know. I, at the time, I, I felt really confused. Um, I was afraid. Uh, there was even some guilt in there too. You know, I didn't understand what happened. I just felt, okay, maybe I could have prevented this. You know, you go through your mind, well, well, what could I have done differently? You know, how could I have changed this? And it was hard. You know, I. It, what made it even more difficult is that when my mom went to go confront the manager, come to find out the manager was her was this man's daughter. And he, she tried to cover for him. You know, she tried to cover, cover up what he done. Oh, that's not what happened. Your son's six. He doesn't understand what he's talking about. Um, you know, and, and you know, I, I was six, but I knew what happened. I was there. Um, and what was un, what was unfortunate about the whole situation? I wasn't the first boy this had happened to from this individual. And you know, I didn't really talk about it. So I was probably eighteen or nineteen. I just didn't. You know, I try to make light of the situation or whatever. I try to make it make it okay. And I think I, you know, I was just hurt. I was hurt and I didn't know what to do. I didn't know how to explain how I was feeling. Um, you know, there was this point in my life where I had to be the toughest dude in the room. I was like, I'll fight anybody. I'm ready, bring it. You don't want these hands, that sort of thing, right? Um, but that was just a defense. You know, I, I just didn't know how to feel. So I felt like if I could be the toughest dude, nobody's gonna mess with me again. Know, and as a grown man, I'm like, yeah, I can defend myself, but in my mind, I was still six years old and defenseless. Um, you know, this was terrible. And I, and I look back and I, you know, I'm like, God, why did this happen? I don't understand. I don't understand why this happened to me. I didn't deserve this, right? But I think, you know, even though this was this man's sin that brought this, God still worked through it. You know, this is one of the things in my life that really helped me come to know God, helped me to understand His love, His compassion. And really to show me the need for him. You know, like, when we go through stuff like this, it's like, man, I don't, under, I don't, I don't get it. I don't understand what's going on. And I, we want to justify it, but sometimes it's just somebody else's sin that we have to deal with in our own lives, and that's unfortunate. But because of this man's sin, God still worked through it to help me understand who God really was, to really seek after God. God is patient, loving, and merciful, operating for our eternal good outside our notions of time and fairness. His only goal is to reconcile his children to him. You know, I still wrestle with why bad things happen to good people. You know, I still work part-time on the ambulance, and every now and again I'll get something. I'm like, I don't get it. I don't understand. And I think that's where myself, what helps me, you know, and I think as disciples, what helps us. And sometimes we just need to get on our knees and pray. You know, and that's, that sounds really simple, so it sounds really trivial, but sometimes we just need to let go. Sometimes we need to surrender the fact that, hey, God, I don't understand what's happening here, but I trust that you're going to work through it. That you're going to that you're going to work through this awful mess, and some glory is going to come through it to show how powerful you really are. And I think this is a topic that we will continue to come back time and time and time again, because unfortunately, there's not a shortage of terrible things happening in the world. But again, this is where we can really grow in our faith, grow in our knowledge and our understanding that, you know what, God, you're going to work. I trust that you're going to work. That takes a lot of faith to get on your knees and say, okay, God, I don't understand what's going on, but I trust that you're going to work despite this. It takes a lot of faith. Sometimes we want the answer, and sometimes God's going to give it to us. And we got to be okay with that. Sometimes you got to wrestle with it, but eventually that's where we need to get to, is that, God, I trust, even if I don't see the answer, that you're going to work despite this. Romans 8, 28 says, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Here in a second, we're going to take the bread and the cup. <clears throat> you know, I know this is a topic that can stir a lot of emotions. Uh, it does for me. You know, it makes me question God. It makes me question, you know, my spiritual walk. And sometimes I just don't, uh, 
but yeah, I just wrestled with God. I don't understand what you're doing here. Um, but in all things, we always need to take it back to Jesus. Jesus was as close to a good person as they come, and he didn't even consider himself to be good. You know, he was as close as they come, as they come. God's son on this earth. You know, God doesn't want any of his children uh, to perish. He wants them all to come back to him and repent and come to love him, right? Um, but it's interesting, you know, when we talk about bad things happening to good people, there wasn't a better example than Jesus. Jesus didn't deserve anything from God. And yet he was persecuted, mocked, beaten, spit on, flogged, crucified for something he really didn't deserve. Really, I mean, that's really the definition of bad things happening to good people, right? It is, right there. But I'm so grateful it did happen. I'm so grateful God worked in that situation so that he gave all of us a chance in this room to come to know him, to come to love him, you know, that our sins would be washed away. He had to send his own son. That's hard. I have never, I have never had to, I've seen children die, unfortunately, but I've never had to bury it with a child. I've never had to see a child, like my own child. I can't imagine what that would be like. It's a lot, you know, and yet God was willing to allow that to happen so that we might have a chance at salvation. You know, I'm grateful that we have a chance at redemption. So, you know, let's remember that even when the terrible things happen, um, God is still working. God is still going to work even even if we don't see it, even if we're not, you know, maybe just be in the hearts of the people who responded. Maybe just be in the hearts of the people who had to take care of whatever that situation was. I don't know. You know, I don't, I don't claim to be God. We have to trust that even in the darkest days, God is still working. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right, let's pray.